All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Deer Gear Podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Durr. Today, I'm joined by Fire Knock owner, Dorge Wong, and we're going to talk about fletchings, veins, feathers, the things on the back of your arrow that help you steer your broadhead for the perfect flight. This is a topic that I have found extremely interesting, and I've taken tons and tons and tons of time researching, wondering, do different fletchings do different things? Does the orientation matter? Does helical matter? Offset? Should you shoot them? Should you fletch them straight? How do you choose the right vein, the right configuration for your arrow? And it all really boils down to speed, how fast you're shooting. So I am happy to share this podcast with you guys. I, as soon as I stopped hitting record, I was like, wow, that was good. I learned a lot. I, I had some questions that I needed answered and I got them answered. So I hope this podcast help you guys out. I hope you guys learned something from this. Before we get into it, Exodus has a really cool sweepstakes giveaway going on with Osseo gear. You guys have heard Joe Miles on this podcast before. If you haven't already, go back and listen to that episode. It was really good. It was all about Osseo gear, about camouflage, about its effectiveness in the woods. And so we teamed up with Osseo to give away one lucky bow hunter a $750 gift card to the Exodus store and a $750 gift card to the Osseo store. So you can get geared up for this coming fall, get you some trail cameras, a fresh dozen Exodus MMT arrows, and you can get yourself some really high quality, effective camouflage. That interests you, check the link in the description below to enter. All you have to do is enter your name and email address and you will be in the winner of that will be announced via email and on the exodus podcast on may 19th so make sure you guys are in it to win it and tune in to find out if you are that one lucky bow hunter this year with that being said let's get into this really great podcast with dorge Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Deer Gear Podcast. George and I are here with you guys this morning. And today we're going to talk about arrow fletchings, arrow veins, feathers, everything about fletching arrows. As I kind of dive more into um, the off season here, I'm trying to learn more about what makes arrow flight the best possible it can be. And then there's, there's just, this is a topic that there's so much differing opinions on i want to hear from dorge who has worked on developing an arrow vein that is quite different from everything that's on the market and we're going to talk about it, kind of how he came up with what he came up with talk about some um arrow vein specifics fletching specifics like profile how long a fletching is what it does how to get less noise the whole thing dorge you down for that oh absolutely i mean that's this is actually a quite an interesting subject and, you know, just like everybody else, including myself, everybody thinks fletching is, is nothing more than some, uh, some feathers you put on the back of an arrow. It cannot be more untrue from what we believe. Trust me, I have learned a lot from a lot of experts, and I'm uh, here to share. Good. I have a ton of questions about fletchings because like I said, there's so many differing opinions. So I'm going to start with a question that's kind of just top of mind. It's fresh to me because I've been mm-hmm. listening to um, Iron Will Bill to mm-hmm. talking about his, the new vein that he has kind of constructed. And one of his things is vein profile. He likes mm-hmm. a larger profile vein compared to a smaller profile vein. What does the profile of the vein do? Okay, first of all, before we say anything before this, let's go into detail on what a vein does and what a vein needs to do. A vein is not a vein at different speed. A vein is not a vein at different front of center. A vein is not a different vein at different flex of the shaft. This is something that I think most people do not really understand to start with, Okay. okay? A vein can be anything. As long as your speed is not 260 feet per second. So like a, a, a feather or it just doesn't matter? A feather, matter. whatever. It really doesn't matter. I mean, you can do three really weird things as long as you can keep the arrow reasonably straight. Under 260 feet per second, you can pretty much do anything. You can put three different ways at three different positions, four, five, six, eight. I mean, at that moment, uh, 
you really don't make that big a difference because the aerodynamic of a shaft is really not developed at that moment. It's like what's the shape of a car when you want to drive it 20 miles per hour. It really not that big a deal. Now, George, when you say that, do you mean with a broadhead on or does that change anything? It really don't matter at, okay. that, at that speed because the rotational is not there. The aerodynamic frontal portion is not there. And the effect of the vein is really not there. So technically, when you throw anything on the back of arrow, the only thing you do is induce drag. Okay. In other words, you, you, the drag, you will develop in anything, just like uh, as, drag in, uh, as, the, as the drag of the air to any surface increases, I would say at 250, 260, as I going lower, it really does not matter. Does a larger profile help the smaller profile? At this moment, you, the only question is that, how big a parachute you want when you drop? Answer is that if you want speed to hit, the smaller the better. If you really don't want, if, if you have a very bad in directional control, the larger the better. I mean, so anybody who fly kites knows, the longer the, the tail, the more stable is, is go straight up, but the more you can control it, the more you can fly it and you won't go far and you won't go fast. That's pretty much what the vein does at under 260. Now 270, 280, things begin to change. Really dramatic change. But let's go back to the vein and uh, we wanna talk about the ability of the vein and what it does first before we go into that. So let's put some benchmark first. The reason the feather was used since beginning of time because they have one very important factor is that it is the lightest weight profile we can consistently get. That's the reason feather was used all this time. And of course, if you're one of those guys who would like to build traditional veins, you can, instead of sticking it, you can tie it and you can put the feathers back, which is one of the more capable ability of feathers because you can open the feathers and smooth them back to hook together because inside feathers hooks. But then of course there's left feather and right feather and how you, how you behave. Those are really, to be fair, you not important when you start shooting higher speed. I mean, you look great, don't get me wrong. I mean, imagine you got one cock feather that is on the left wing, the two feather on the right wing. I mean, it just doesn't look cool, but you believe me, they shoot the same. Because you're shooting a traditional bow, the speed is not there. The shaft is not, even the flex, shaft flex a lot, it really do not matter. And in the case of a recurve bow, you absolutely need to use feather. Anybody tell you that they recurve without an air rest, they can use, uh, what you call it, the, the more than high or low profile veins, they're crazy. Because those veins do not give like feather does. Because That's feather right. will collapse. Yep, but at the same time, uh, let's go back to with feather material. Feather as the material, the moment you shoot it, most of the time the feather itself will collapse. That means feather have zero effect until you drop around 240, 250. So when you shoot high speed bow, what you do is that you collapse all the veins as a feather with toast to zero effect until the speed drop down to that stage. Then the feather will finally stand up. Then you have effects. So, I got a few customers who absolutely insist to shoot feather, but they should go 300 feet per second. Wow. What, what they pretty much what they're doing is that they absolutely have zero vein effect when they launch it. I mean, it's a good, it's bad, but the bad part is that it's getting very loud. Yeah, that's, that was going to be my question. It seems like a feather would be louder at that speed. Because at the end of the day, the number one sound from every single air foil profile is fluttering. I mean, of course, you, you can put a crack on it, you got whistle, but we are talking about surface pressure. So fluttering is your number one sound maker. Okay. Just like you blow into a piece of paper on both sides, it's gonna behave like a whistle. If, which is also why 90% of the veins, the moment you go any, play, any speed higher than say 290, they really get loud. Be whether put it straight, put it, put it offset, whatever, they, the fluttering is going to be your number one prop generator of sound. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, I can do offset, I can do helical, I can do straight. The fact is that if you are good at tuning bows, I will tell you, straight is always the best because no matter, of the least amount of drag. 
no matter what vein configuration, no matter what vein you use, straight is the best. Straight is always the best if you know how to tune the bow. Okay. Because see, with a little bit of rotation, you always get consistency in the air flight. I mean, just like rotation is a very good consistent factor if, if all components are concentric. Now, that brings to the fact that you said a lot of people say, well, you know, I build my own arrow, it's as good as it gets, and so on. That's a matter of opinion, unfortunately. Now, let, let, let's, let's uh, stop. I, wa well, I want to uh, increase the speed, and then we'll talk about the effect of veins. Because at 240, 250 recurves, most of the people, the vein really have nothing much more than a small amount of drag. So you really don't make a difference. You can put, I mean, of course, if you put one vein, a ginormous one and two small vein, you're, you're deconcentric the entire arrow. That can work, okay? But in some cases, in the case of uh, when you're under 250, 260, it will still function reasonably well because speed, aerodynamic as aerodynamic, we know it haven't kicked in. Now you move to about 270, aha things begin to change. This is where front of center, broadheads, shaft dynamics all come into play. And then this is also about the profile of aims too. As most people know, the more steering control you have, the taller the vein need to be. Okay. Because see, this is one part that a lot of people really have I think they really need to go back and read the read the aerodynamic books. If you got a vein, got a wing that's tall, long, wide, and narrow, you have the most efficient vein. Wings. You got a wing that is sh sh the wingspan is narrow and the wing itself is long. Those are not those are have no flying abilities. Those are ground effect systems. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. In other words, you will find out that any, any, any animal that use a long, long ability, like the flying snake, it is not the, they say, well, the flying snake have really, really sh uh, short, uh, short, short wings, but they are very long. If anybody actually study it, notice that the, the snake do not fly straight. They use the body to go sideways to catch the wind. So when you put a long wing sideways, what do you end up with? The same profile as a long wing, isn't it? Yeah. See, people, I mean, and I mean, things that have been flying for a very long time, they all learn the same way. The width of the, the in other words, the length of the airfoil, in other words, how tall the profile is a vein is, is a lot more important how wide the profile is. Okay. I mean, very simple way. Think of the most inefficient windmills are the windmill with the long, with widest blade, or the super high profile, super high efficient windmills. The blades are narrow and tall. So in other words, the tip speed, the air that passing the tip gives you the most effect, which is also, you know, you look at all the new airplanes, which fly at, uh, none of them fly over Mach. You notice that if you do not over, go over supersonic, they would actually prefer the wing tip to tip up. The moment you go to a supersonic plane, they don't have that anymore. Hmm. But as veins we know of, we'll never reach supersonic. That's yeah. not possible. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, the low speed air for knowledge that Professor Selig has read so many papers with, I think is a good starting point. And not to mention Professor Lele, out of Stanford University, he's writing on or the animal flight is really, really what we need to focus. Because first of all, they are subsonic. But unfortunately, unfortunately for us that we are flying arrow around, not today, in today's current world, I believe vertical bows are flying between 290 all the way to 350, while crossbows are flying between 350 to five or about 520. Those are significantly different numbers. Oh yeah. Because you need to understand at 400 feet per second, you are wide into the about 260 miles per hour. Whew. But let's don't go that first because I want to 
since we most of you are listener right now is dealing with vertical bowls. Let's talk about what happened when you're 290 feet per second. Because 290 to 300 feet per second is where everything sort of changed. And that's why a lot of customers, the moment they get the speed of that, first of all, the accuracy suffered. They can't shoot right. And the moment they put a product on it, it don't even fly right. <laughs> because every part of that arrow, including the vein, has to work together. Sure. Because aerodynamic now is not your friend, it's your enemy. But at the same time, if you can turn that enemy into a friend, you can do ridiculous stuff. Now, why did that make such a big difference? Because of about 270, 80, 90, or they call it the 300 plus or minus 20 feet per second range, things really dramatically changed because drag become a really big deal. Let me show you, let, let, me, let me just to confirm that I'm saying it correct. About at 300 feet per second, you're looking at about 200 miles per hour. Yeah. Now, nobody I know of drove 200 miles per hour. Nope. But remember, the arrow is a significantly smaller projectile compared to a car. Oh, yeah. So I would say, I mean, let, let, let me quote one I learned from Formula One. He said 175 miles per hour, you use 72% of the energy of the vehicle to go forward against drag. Wow. At 200 miles per hour, that number moved to something like an 85, 88. You can see how ridiculous it gets. Yeah. That's at 200 miles per hour. At 300 feet per second, it is 204 miles per hour. So, if we understand drag is become such a big deal at about 300 feet per second, which I will drop it back to 280 to show you the, to, to discuss the effect. First, then we think about it. At that speed, if you've got veins on it, what does the vein actually do at that moment? Now, this is where the profile, the material, and the shape of the vein and the position of the vein and also how well it's flushed become important. I mean, right now, we, we cannot talk about bad aero build to start with yeah. because that's a whole different kind of worm. We're talking of the inserts, the aero shaft, the spine. Assume all of them are perfect. Yep. We're talking about vein today and vein only. The position of the vein is one of the most misunderstood, but you just put it on. You know that the absolute best position of the vein is that the vein sticking out half of its size behind the arrow. So like it would cover the knock. Yeah, the knock should be right in the middle of the vein yeah. if you can do it. Yeah. But then we have two problems. First of all, the vein is not structurally strong enough to do that. Second, you have no way to shoot that arrow. Third, you have no way to fudge it yeah. because the half of the vein would be fluttering so bad because the vein itself has no structure. You had to rely on the shaft. So what I'm saying is that the further the back of you can put the vein, the better of you up aerodynamically, assuming the vein do not have an air, it's not an airfoil profile. Okay. So what does that do to what why? Because if you look at every single airplane that known to mankind, the tail end about a third away from the end of the tail of the red rudder. Every one of them looks exactly like that. Think about it. The tail already extends behind the airplane, the fuselage. Yep. Why do they do that? That's the most efficient way. It's about aerodynamic vortexes and all the rest. But how come it, it, some people want to put their vein up all the way in front because they don't know how to shoot with the vein close to the back and sometimes the vein touched the face and they got very concerned. Yeah. Let me give you an idea. As long as the, the vein touch the face consistently every time, vein on facial contact do not make any difference. As long as the contact is the same. That's the key. Most people, the moment you touch them and they put a face mask, put beer, whatever that is, they can't shoot it right. So they had to, they had to minimize that. So they put the vein more and more forward to the arrow. But what does that do? Now, if you remember the discussion we have about how an arrow flexes, right? 
the knot is the the kissing the, is the kissing part of the fish, like a tuna. The further you are away from the knot, the higher the position. The vein is based on the flex. The worse it gets, because you induce stress significantly. Remember, we talk about the tip of the the tip of the air, the vein. As the arrow flexes, if you put on further and further away from the the tip, the, the, or the natural tip, which is the knocking point of an arrow, the higher the profile of the vein is because you need to increase, include the flex to okay. the height of the vein. Okay. Now to make it even worse, if the tip of the vein is now high, what happened to the other two? They're low now. Yeah. Because remember, you're dealing with a three prong. Just imagine if you got a Muslim Ben star, that is your piece. And as you flex your arrow, that piece, the whole three point is moving up and down, left and right. Yep. What do you think the vortex is look like? Chaos. That's yeah. the word. Yep. So that's the reason when you start shooting high speed, the higher the spine, the faster the recovery, the better the arrow flight, the less the sound. Because you want to, re you just remember that three point star. The moment you move the arrow, how does it flex? Imagine three point star flex up and down and the arrow is trying to turn. How off are every one of them off center? The fact is that every one of them is off center. Right. So what you, and the further the arrow forward you got, the higher those three point star move, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> so basically, you, basically, mm -hmm. um, when you're moving the the vein on the shaft, you're changing the center of pressure and the center of gravity, correct? Yes, but the, the center of pressure is actually because he, you're not just changing it, you're constantly moving it. Right, yeah. That means when, the, when as the arrow try to recover, you are adding a huge amount of non-centerable force to the back of the arrow. Yep. This do not matter much as long as you're shooting low speed because aerodynamic effect is not there. Mm -hmm. Or I think it's not the dominant factor. I mean, it's like the best way I always use is that imagine you are now uh, able to fly or, or drive a jumbo 747 at 25 miles per hour going down on the highway on a jumbo 747. How much aerodynamic effect you got on the plane? <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's yeah. 25 miles per hour. I mean, it's like driving a square box down on the highway at 45, 25 miles per hour. It really don't matter. Try to push it to 70. You may not have the front wheel anymore. Right. If the box is light, you won't be able to drive it. No. Same thing. Because the speed, remember, we're talking 60, 70 miles per hour at 300 feet per second. That's 204. I mean, to be fair, 204.545 miles per hour. That's a ridiculous amount of speed <laughs> for a, for a non-powered projectile. And of course, the second, let me, let me, let me show you this. At 505 feet per second, which is where what some of the newer crossbow is, is 344 miles per hour. Holy crap. And you think aerodynamic is not the key. And what is really driving aerodynamics at that speed? Veins. And imagine this, you got a, you got a big broadhead. It's not gonna fly. No. Nope. It's just not going to fly. I mean, the easiest thing, get a sports car and then put a one foot, put a one by, uh, one by four wood board in front of that sports car and see how well it drives. Good At much. 100 miles per hour, I'll tell you, that car won't even drive. Yeah. You may not even have the front wheel on the floor anymore. That's how bad it gets. That's only 100 miles per hour. Now, the material of the vein, I'm still at the 270 feet per second. Okay. This is part that I really think a lot of people really have, have not understand how that whole thing fly together. Because see, when you, got, when you go to that speed, what you are trying to prevent is fluttering. What is the easiest to overcome fluttering? Is to make it harder. The moment you make it, make it stiffer. As you increase the stiffness, fluttering goes away. Or at least minimized. 
that's the reason I remember the time when GoTip still own vein tech. We have a discussion about how stiff a vein need to be. The answer is that the stiffening vein gives you, first of all, most of the stiffer vein are taller. Assuming the same profile, a stiffer vein will decrease less fluttering. The stiffer vein will have less, uh, 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 because when you're fluttering, you always got that uneven surface drag of the air. Mm -hmm. The higher the speed, the higher, the louder the fluttering goes. Okay. Now then, then some people will say, why did why did why did a blazer fly so much better than a traditional AAE, say three inch, four inch, or an eastern five inch veins? Again, we look. Let's go back to aerodynamics one hundred and one. The aerodynamic profile is based on how wide the wingspan is, not how long the air passing through a surface. When the air passing through a surface, it gives you directional control. Yes. But remember, the same molecule is rolling out on the same place over and over and over again, while a, a high aspect ratio, which means that the length times width is higher, which is like all the gliders, they have much better lift control. Okay. I know I'm, I'm, I'm dabbling on aerodynamics, but there's no way around it. Yeah. At the end of the day, the vein is all about aerodynamics. Now, when we talk about this subject, I want to throw something out to start with. We're assuming that right now we're shooting all viewpoints, okay? We're not shooting broadheads because the moment we shoot broadheads, the entire concept of veins has to significantly change to the point that when I design an arrow for a customer, when the first thing, I, the first thing I always ask, what are the broadheads you have to shoot? And what is the speed that you intend to shoot? That usually I will able to help them. Because without that too, I will guarantee you, unless you're shooting an arrow that's less than 260 feet per second, it would not be a happy experience. That's fair. Now let, let's talk about the uh, surface texture. And also since we're talking about rigidity, which is the hardness of the vein, how stiff is it? Yep. Remember stiffness have two ways to accomplish. One is by using a stiffer material. The other is to make it thicker. Okay. When you make anything thicker, it behaves more and more like an airfoil, which means a perfectly smooth airfoil. That's the reason, you know, in the old days, like the vein tag, they really actually work quite well. But if you make a super thick piece and it was evenly distributed, the moment it starts fluttering, you can't control it. I mean, it is like a continuous because it will resonate. Now you add another level of sound to the entire vein. And not to mention, most of the veins do not flutter the same. So you got a non-concentric fluttering vein. The moment you put different vein at the speed over 300, I would say 280 and up. That's where a lot of people with problem with veins to say, okay, I do all this. But then they also forgot one factor. The moment when you start inducing spin, let me step back. I forgot one thing. Spin is good as long as you know what you're getting is within your expectation. Spin is horribly wrong if you do not know what it does and don't have the concept to control it. A blazer at 260 feet per second all the way to about infinity is about eight to 12 revolution, regardless of helical angle. I mean, it may change more from 200 all the way to 270. You can induce more spin as you move from say the 200 feet per second, you do half a degree offset all the way to four degree offset. The arrow will spin more all the way to about 280 feet per second. The moment you hit 280 and up, I don't care what you do. The higher the helical you go, the higher the speed you go, you all end up to about eight to 12. Yes, okay. that's 50% th that's difference. Because the moment you go highest, assuming the arrow shaft do not flex much. So we are talking and only the condition of the vein. So that alone, give me a whole new approach to what this means. Because it tell me, the, if people say, I'm shooting high speed, 
the more helical we got, the better the arrow spins. No, it does not. The moment you pass 315, I don't care. You, you, the moment you put the vein sideways, the arrow is still going to turn up 8 to 12. Why is the that? The reason because because the drag become to be opposite effect. Because okay. the more drag you induced, the more the arrow is trying to fight it. Okay. You're not turning the arrow. Remember, the whole arrow is a long piece. You're turning from the back. Imagine the current is trying to turn the propeller. That's pretty much what it is. And that 8 to 12 revolutions is in 20 yard, 20 yard increments. Correct, 20 yard increments. Okay. So the more helical you put on it, they say, oh, the arrow spins more correctly. If you really put a high-speed camera like I have, you see that you really don't make a difference. Oh, the arrow flies more true. No. You just induce drag to lower the speed so that, and then increasing, the, just like increasing the tail of a kite. So the arrow looks more true because you've got a parachute behind it. Yeah. That's where veins is really not your friend. The moment you put high, heavy helical on the back when you pass that 290. At 315, you're going to regret it. People say, oh, my arrow flies so true at 320 feet per second with a three degree helical. I think what you need to do with today's iPhone, you can see yourself, try it. Don't take my word for it because until you see it, you won't believe it. You said the arrow comes out all kind of weird. And then depends on how good you put the vein. That's another thing. How good can you put the vein? Because see, when you do a helical, what you're inducing is drag. Let me say, what's the shape of the parachute? Well, you can have a few holes on it. It really doesn't matter. You can flutter a little bit off. It also does not matter too. So that's pretty much how everything goes. So why is aerofane like the, what we have, what we have found out makes so different? Because aerofane is not a vein, it's an airfoil. It's based on the principle on, on fluid dynamics. It creates a low, a low and high pressure zone that cons, cause, I mean, just think about it. If quote unquote of two by four can fly, why do we even bother to make airfoils? <laughs> yeah. It never did. I mean, the, the, the power of the flight on the fixed wing compared to animal flight on a, on a flexible vein, wing is a very, very, very interesting science. I think Professor Lee have one of the most experienced and papers on that. I mean, especially his, uh, is is uh, what you call it? Uh, uh, his research on hummingbirds really give you insight, and also I think he did a really good video on uh, on an owl flight, which also give me a lot of insight. Now, but I cannot overemphasize Professor Savick's help on the aerowing approach, on how I come up with aerowing two, aerowing three, and aerowing four, but. The world is not ready for everything for yet. I can guarantee you. <laughs> the, the world haven't even learned how everything too works. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, if you have done any tests, you'll find out that most arrows don't really behave with how the veins supposed to do. I mean, you, you your firm did quite a you had quite a few videos. I remember the the video and the testing you did you did with Kyle proved that. The serving have a bigger thing to do with, with, with anything else when you first throw the arrow out into the open. Yep. So we will let the customer, we will let our listener go back to that and revisit that. So I won't touch it for now. So the vein, assuming that comes out perfectly, and now the vein is turning. Okay. The least amount of induced drag, something that's recent I told people, if you really don't know, I want to use arrow vein, you have a really big broadhead, use a high profile vein and do about half to quarter of degree offset, you're good all the way to about 500 feet per second. It's not the vein is stiff enough to handle it. But then we also have to deal with the fact is that you now have three drag surface. The concentricity of that drag surface it's important, but not as critical if the drag surface is an airfoil. And some people have four surfaces. Right. I mean, three or four or five or six. I mean, people went through that. 
I mean, what's the difference between say three and four? Well, if you don't know how to flush and one of them is off, say is off, you still have three good surfaces to work with <laughs> instead of four. And not to mention if you deal with crosswind, the fourth profile is absolute worst because at two position of your arrow doing a 180 degree turn, you have full contact surface when the wing is at say the 100 zero position and 90 degree position. While a three vane position at any position, your entire crosswind pressure is identical. Yeah. Does five do the work? Sure. Six too. Five and six are both, I mean, six is worse than five. I would tell you that. What you do is that you're increasing the drag. That means you're just, slow how much down. tail do you need? You just slow it down. Make the arrow heavier, increase the, increase the error that you can possibly put on the vein, but they also decrease the, the significance of the vein is not put right. Mm -hmm. Seriously, a lot of people shoot better with four veins because they don't know how to tune a bow. They can't put the board head right. That's the reason four veins shoot better because you got a bigger parachute. Yep. The error is lower. What happens to noise when you add a fletching? Well, uh, that's a very difficult question. The reason I say it's a difficult question because you got one more surface or drag, but you decrease the speed. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So which, which way is better? I'd say, so what speed are you shooting? Yeah. How flexible is your arrow? Because the higher the arrow, the flexes, the worse it gets. The higher the front of center, the worse it gets. Because see, the moment the front of center go high enough, the head is leading everything. That's where the tail, imagine this. If the front of center is really have really high, say over 15%, the moment you shoot a normal arrow, say with the correct spine, the arrow is not, the tail, the arrow is not gonna be centered anymore. I mean, like a lot of the light and commercials and videos you saw, the light is moving 12 inches left to right from the arrow. Well, if the lighter knot is moving 12 inches from the center, 12 inches left and right, which is six inch off center, where is the vein? Yeah, an inch past that, two inches past that. Right, and as it flexes in the air, what happened to aerodynamics? You've got a big ginormous fan with three, a, 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 thing, a, a handle with three long fan on it, fanning around. Yep. And the broadhead based on momentum is trying to correct it. <laughs> now imagine, imagine the, that's a really bad recipe. That's the reason front of center in high speed bow is an absolute no no with, with veins. The smaller the profile, the better off you are. Because eventually the arrow will correct itself. Like that's the reason the larger the diameter of the shaft, the faster recover, the better the arrow flight. I mean, and then of course, the, the longer the duration of power stroke, again, when you do high let off, 80, 90% let off, your duration of power stroke is longer. That means the arrow flex curve is higher. The duration of the flex is also higher. That means the surface of the vein encountering the wind is longer because they take the arrow longer to recover. <laughs> yeah. I mean, tell me one part that I say is good for the arrow flight. None of, it's it. none. <laughs> yeah, none of it. <laughs> but everybody, I mean, some people think, oh, we're shooting the latest, the most best design, 85, 90% of 166 arrow with 80% FOC, I say. Just like uh, one of those movies. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Now, let me ask you this. So um, mm -hmm. when you talk about the stiffness, is there a point where it's too stiff? No. Okay. That is, uh, that, 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 the too stiff doesn't, doesn't come into play. The only thing that's coming into play is that when it's when so-called too stiff, is that you got too brittle. That means, I mean, like one of the sort of joke that I was told from uh, one of the Air Force experts. How many wings does a plane have when you go through a forest? None. <laughs> All the wings broke off. Yeah. <laughs> and then people like softer profile veins because 
the moment in winter time when you shoot through an animal, the chance the wing would tear off its legs. Okay. But then how much, how important is to a person if control over the arrow flight, that will fly true. Yeah, just reflush the arrow. Exactly. I mean, if you are so concerned of reflushing the arrow, maybe hunting is not what you do. Because <laughs> just like, I don't want to spend a dime on gas while I know that that, that forest that 20 miles from me is a good spot. Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't drive. Then you're not hunting. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and then, so I talked that I, I talked about, I, I was listening to Iron Will Bill when mm -hmm. there were some seminars that he was doing when he developed the vein that he was using. And then, so mm -hmm. I bought, I bought some of those veins to feel them and see what they're like. They're, mm -hmm. they're pretty flimsy. They're not very stiff. They're not very rigid. Mm -hmm. And I was curious cause he's, he's saying that this is going to fly a uh, larger fixed blade broadhead the best. So I was curious what you thought about. Absolutely. That. He is absolutely correct in that. Because see what they have when you fix it, when you fly a large fixed blade broadhead, that is your master. How okay. many master you want with the, you, 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 this is like how many coke, how many head coke do you want in the kitchen? Yeah. If you've got a large broadhead, you want the flimsiest vein you can possibly be because okay. you don't want the vein to do any steering. The less steering you have, the less aerodynamic you have, other. the less force you get, they fight each other. Exactly. It's like turning a corner. You got a strict axle car trying to turn the corner. It ain't gonna work because the inner and outer is turning at a different rate. Just like imagine if your vein want to turn at say eight revolution per second, while the profile of your broadhead based on initial turn is one to four. So they are fighting fifty percent all okay. the time. All right, all right, that makes sense. And then another thing that I kind of took um, away from the seminar that he did, I just watched a real small portion of it, but. The, he showed a graphic of a vein, which is his vein, mm -hmm. and where and how high the pressure was on the vein as it was rotating through the air. So it was like color coded and like low mm -hmm. pressure was blue and then the highest pressure was red. And his point with it was um, the highest pressure point on the vein is furthest from the shaft. And if you had a smaller profiled vein, you would be missing that part of the um, Of pressure. course, it's the same thing again. We're talking aspect ratio of any of, of any airfoil. Yep. The smaller the profile, the lower the height of the vein, the less pressure you've got. It's, it, it, intentionally, you thought you have more control. No, you don't. That's the reason you find out that a long profile vein can a slow pro, a short vein. The moment you reach a certain speed, which is the magic gain, 280 feet per second, it really don't make it that big a difference. Okay. But at okay. high ultra high speed, we're talking. Supersonic, yes. The profile, the length of the vein is important. Okay, so really, which is which? So for subsonics, yeah. No, I mean that's the reason you look at it. The corn cord, everybody will fight supersonic because the air is so critical. You want to control every single air. That's the reason they all have delta wings. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you really think through the process, most of the most of the successful high speed compound bow veins they're all delta wings yeah yep and you know in, and i will tell you one thing because see when i learned and i learned that just like when the arrow wing one first come out it's a really long profile long as in from front to back not on on the width okay yep. Yep. because see, I, I want to let, let, let's let's use the words let's define the words assuming the wing is on the on the 12 o'clock position pointing up so when I say long, that means front to back. When I say height, that means from shaft to top. Yep. Let's say height and length because people get confused, really. Yeah. You do not want a long profile wing. You want a high profile wing with a short width. Okay. It is the same thing with every single airfoil. There's no way around it. Anybody who pick up a book, any book from aerodynamics, it's the same thing. So long and short is bad. Correct. And short and tall is good. For anything over 280 feet per second. Okay. So like, so tack vein, uh, you have mm -hmm. like super long and they're, they're pretty short. No, Remember, no. they are all aimed at a target between 240 to 290. They are not 300 feet per second or more. 
you try to put a tech wing on a crossbow and see what you got. No good. I mean, you you get the same thing, Blazer, Vain Tech, uh, AAE, same thing. You got exactly the same because they pretty much have the same aspect ratio. And then when people talk about how the tail curves and so on, those are only true when you hit about 280, 270, mm -hmm. 300. Nope, it don't matter. Okay. So for the trailing, it's not an issue. Aerovane, what are the dimensions on Aerovane? The Aerovanes are exactly two inch long. Okay. And then they are half inch tall on Aerovane 2. Aerovane 3 is original, the same as Aerovane. Aerovane 3 is the same as Aerovane 2, except you folded the last four millimeter upwards. Like an airplane would. So, yep. But I literally folded that with the same yep. material. Yep. That's the original Aerovane 2 is. Okay. Now, what's the major difference between Aerovane and come say, so the AE, the Blazer, the, the tech on the same two inch profile, why do they behave so differently? Okay, this is where things get interesting. I would, I would now pin the whole thing at 300 feet per second, okay? okay? The, all the rest of them, no matter how, I mean, how much offset they are doing at 300 feet per second, you're looking about eight to 12. That's every 20 yards. Aeroving 2 is doing about 90 to 120, right on the get-go for the first 20 yards. That's the difference. And so that's it's an interesting thing because it's something that you mentioned way back when. And I was like, oh, yeah, you never really think of that as an advantage. Everyone talks about momentum and what that does for um, penetration. And when you have more rotation, you call, you call it rotational mass. What does that do mm -hmm. for penetration? Actually, you do, I mean – Penetration is twofold. Okay. Assume the penetration, we, we assume the penetration is, is field point only. The rotational mass will actually significantly increase the penetration. Okay. But it would not be good if you use something like a two blade broadhead, isn't it? Why is that? The moment the arrow hit the thing, what the, the whole shot you try to turn. Yep. Now you've got a blade, you go in and you screw. You lose all your, you can lose a ton of KE on it. Okay. I mean, most people didn't think the moment you cut halfway through cutting, you turn the blade. Mm -hmm. You can't cut no more, isn't it? Sure. Yep. That's the reason most two blades don't really like any rotation that's high. And which is the reason why, like Bill say that the vein is softer, he had better results because the vein is not going to turn the broadhead. The broadhead still are the dominant factor. I like that. Okay. That's, that's coming. It's hitting me. I'm understanding. All right. So um, that's interesting. Now with a mechanical broadhead and it deploys mm -hmm. still, still no, still not a benefit. Depends on how they deploy. I mean, imagine if a mechanical blade is trying to deploy sideways with a large blade and the arrow try to rotate, the arrow can't rotate and the, the blade can't go forward, isn't it? Because yeah. imagine you just open the blade, you push it and try to rotate the arrow. Ain't going to work. You got to bend the blade, which yeah. is why that I remember the first time when we tried, uh, we tried to do some serious testing on Green Reapers. We literally turned the ferrule of the Green Reaper into a pretzel <laughs> on a score put 420 feet per second bolt. With Aerovane 2? Or... There's Aerovane 2 only, even at, uh, at 25 yards. Wow. I mean, the blades are all banned, so is the ferrule, which really turned into petal. And in case of shooting a Montauk with Aeroving 3 out of uh, that moment, you'd be a Scorpion O'Brien Extreme at 60 yards. We broke that blade on the Montauk. Dang. You can see the torque is freaking unreal. Yeah. Because at that moment, I mean, that Aer the Aerobo G is at uh, 650 grains with 170. Uh, uh, at 175 grain insert and tubing, because that was what our original design with Tramahawk, but I just want to see how it works. The moment the arrow, the arrow hit the target, the arrow had so much torque, it snapped the blades off. Wow. So People say, oh, that's a humongous of a force. I think, remember, the arrow is actually flying. That's a circular lift. How much power is it? Well, um, Remember, Jumbo 7, Sub 4, 7 actually flies. What do you think <laughs> causes it to fly? That's the power of lift. Now, we're not just singularly lifting it because we're not fighting gravity. Remember, that's another thing. 
when you have air for the spins, what is it fighting against? Nothing. I mean, when an airplane flies, it's fighting against gravity, right? Yep, yep. When each of the three wing is flying, what is it fighting against? Yeah. The mass of rotation as it goes in, the momentum is there. What is yeah. it fighting? Nothing. Right. The faster it spins, the faster it will spin, the more it retain the energy. I mean, the moment when I just when I when I get through this through my thick skull, I said, "This is <laughs> insane." <laughs> I mean, there's no downside to it. Then I find out that is downside, <laughs> and the downside is not pretty. When, when you I, start using aerovane with with broadheads, yes, because now if aerovane the absolute master. What make the broadhead? The absolute slave. Yep. That's the reason you find out that when you start using Aerovink 2, Aerovink 3, at anything over 3, say 315, you can, for, you can kiss 90% of the broadhead we buy. Everything has to be perfect. Not, and not to mention, you cannot dictate how the arrow spins. Yeah, so um, there's kind of like a, a threshold, I guess, for spin rate on a mm -hmm. lot of like big fixed blade broadheads where they'll start to like pitch and you'll get all kinds of crazy stuff if it's just recently if you i mean like like uh, I, I got a I, I i'm a very good friend with marcus all the way back in 2007 marcus is the original inventor of a german kinetics who would make the silver flame okay which is the original two blade broadhead that everybody seems to like you know why marcus only should feathers so the broadhead, no matter what he kills, the master because his broadhead will fly right because the wing is never the master, the broadhead is the okay. same with iron with, 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 the, with the iron wheels broadhead. You want to make the vein not the master, whatever the broadhead wants, whatever the direction you want, that's what you want to do. That's the reason if you want to shoot arrow wing two at 315 per, 50 feet per second with any of the quote unquote like iron wheel broadhead, not no. gonna happen. <laughs> Yeah, not I mean, happen. it's not going to. I mean, I remember when uh, when Brad Fulton sent me the first one and a half inch cut uh, Ram Cat Diamondback. It was experience I'll never forget. I aim at a target twenty five yard from me. The arrow never make the target. The arrow was. About fifth, about thirty feet to the right of me when it when it reached that. <laughs> no, do you understand what I'm saying? Imagine I'm aiming at target strict at me at twenty five yards. The tar the arrow end up about twenty five yards to the right of the target. No. I mean, it only happened to me once. Is that I was shooting a hoy chuck with the blade loose? That pretty much is the same effect. <laughs> <laughs> Got because here. the moment the, the vein catch the wind, and it depends on how the air is pointing. At that moment, the angle is, the, the moment you catch the wind, it's pointing at whatever angle it's shooting it. Wow. That's it. Yeah. That's the reason, I mean, it's just remember how you explain something from what point of view you explain it have a very, very different effect. But you need to understand the fundamental of why each is doing what. It's not saying, he told me soft the wing is better. He told me how the wing is better. He told me further is better, back is better. Those are all correct and incorrect answer based on how you ask the question. Right. I mean, I, I'll share with one funny story with you, which I was, when I was ready for law school, <laughs> Then I understand why law is not for me. <laughs> I remember the time some the 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 dean showed me. He said, "Dodge, imagine a cup of water. That's half full. That's exactly half. Go argue. It's half empty or it is half full." I said, "There's nothing to argue. <laughs> it's half." <laughs> he, says, <laughs> he said, "Then you are not cut out for law." <laughs> You say why? Because the whole thing is about intent. Yeah. You say, what do you mean by that? You say, the guy who is trying to fill the cup and call it half empty, 
his intent is to fill it. The guy called it half full. His intent is to empty it. That's the difference. I say, but actually it's freaking 50%. There's nothing to argue. He say, that's the reason you and I cannot to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, because the whole thing is about intent. Yeah. Now the same thing again for the veins. Is more rotation better? What do you want it to do? Yeah. You imagine this, if you got arrow vein three at 315 feet per second, that's going close to what? 150 for the uh, 150 to 175 in the first 20 yards. What do you think is gonna happen to say an iron wheel broadhead when you put in something like 20 times the spin rate to that broadhead? Not good things. Where is it gonna fly? Einstein said, no clue. Yes, who knows? <laughs> you have no idea. It will fly somewhere. <laughs> you have no idea where. Yeah. So is the vein bad or is the is the broadhead bad? Answer is neither. The combination. You just use the wrong combination. All right. Yeah. That's... That is the reason. But then at the same time, you say, okay, I really, really want directional control. That means I want to use an arrow that can fly and say, 30 miles per hour crosswind, 120 yards. I want to hit the same freaking spot with an inch and a half. You need high speed rotation. You think you need high speed rotation now because you want to fight, quote unquote, the crosswind. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you want the vein to have the lowest amount of crosswind signature. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, I did not mention what crosswind signature is, but I will rephrase it again. The crosswind signature is one of the most important factor of any vein. The moment you pass 280 feet per second, 270, you start seeing it. Is that when a vein is rotating initial launch for the first, say, 15 yards, what is the profile of the effect of the, of the air that's affected by the vein? How much wind because it's the, displacing? Like how much air it's displacing? Correct. Because remember, in the case of a quick spin, which is made by NAP, way back when I do the test, an NAP long version quick spin will have a crosswind signature at, at 280 feet per second, a crosswind signature with a one and a half degree offset because that's how you put that. I mean, you can put it straight, but it doesn't work well. It's about nine inches. Okay. That's the, that's the uh, diameter. And the moment you increase it about 290 feet per second, it's close to 12 inches. Wow. Now, then you add the flex with the light and with the low F, with the heavy FOC. Now the arrow is flexed 12 inches to start with. What is your crosswind signature? It's not 12 inch. No, 15. It's 24 inch. Oh, wow. Remember, yeah, it's, yeah. it's six inch from each side. When you go to the edge, that's how much you got. Yeah. That's the column of air you're disturbing at that moment. So that's the reason the moment when you increase the arrow size, increase the thickness, and you start shooting arrow vein three in crossbows. I mean, even at 505 feet per second, um, which well, actually we tested at 470. We noticed, I mean, actually Dave Murray did some testing. He got it on a vital limit website. You can check it out. The arrow was doing two a full revolution every two and a quarter inch. Wow. Simple. 20 yards. If I had a two and a quarter, you've got your answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the crosswind signature of the arrow thing three at that moment is less than inch and a, inch and a half. That's, inc that's incredible. That's reason it can go through air. I mean, the moment you break down into science elements, you really don't have any, any way to go around it. The facts is in front of you. Yep. And I always tell people, don't believe what I said, Take, try it. But then you need to control your experiment, understand what you're testing. Yeah. It's kind of hard to control the other variables. Yeah. And people say, oh, I put four veins, it fly better compared to three veins. Yes. How much are you slower? <laughs> or louder. That's the reason you fly... Or louder, how much is it better to you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, one last question here. I just want to make sure I touch mm -hmm. on it. So we talked about uh, vein positioning. Uh, mm -hmm. Ideal world, you said it would be like hanging over the edge of the shaft. When, it's as far back as you can possibly tolerate. 
so when you fletch an arrow that you're going to shoot out of a vertical bow, what is the length? What is the distance? I put three eight, three eight from the back, from the back of the vein to the carbon and the, the, carbon. the carbon. Yes. Okay. And then, of course, in crossbow, you can do that. In yeah. crossbow is whatever the trigger box lets you. Yep. So, um, we get that a lot with the, our builds. That, oh, it's too far back. I, I can't shoot it. It's too far back. Um, and that I think we're going a half inch maybe from the back. Yeah, I mean, it's still not too bad because see, first of all, with arrow concept arrow, like the, your, your Exodus uh, MMT, the arrow flex recovery rate is high. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you take a video of your light and out, you know, the flex recovery rate of nine feet is already covered. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the whole idea is that you want to minimize the tip of the vein with the flex to be the minimum. Okay. The more forward you are, the higher it will be. Okay. You got the flex of the arrow. Remember this okay. part the, from the from the tail of the arrow to the fore is the initial long cycle. Mm -hmm. the, the the lower the number is, the less aerodynamic resistance you have. Yep. And so to put that in like the the technical terms, that the closer to the node you can get that vein. The the, the, the second the, the end node, which is yeah. the knock, the yep. better off you are. Yep. I mean, it's like when you put the leverage, how far, how far you want the, how far, how less an effect you want from the, from the, from the leverage, right next to the fulcrum. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you have the least amount of vectors. Yep. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, man, I'm glad I, I'm glad I uh, decided to talk to you about this because I learned a lot. Um, it seems like every time we talk about a topic, the first time I talked to you, I had zero idea. Like I was just like, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And now I, I learned that and now I go see other people talk about something and now I can kind of relate it back to what you talk about. So I'm glad well, I asked. Well, that's reason we are redoing all the things and then start digging into it. Because see, I would say the best way to do it is that the moment when, a prof just like when I'm a professor or I'm a student back in college, when when professor present a case, you take it for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Then you study and you find you understand, you internalize it. Yep. Now it's yours. Yeah. Then you can see what actually is going on. Then you can think of the next step because without directly being taught, you have to learn it by experience. Right. Trust me, there's not enough life with us to learn this. Trust <laughs> <Yeah>. me, <laughs> anyway, I mean, with me, with all the degrees I have, the moment I go aerodynamics, what did I do? I screwed royally, didn't I? Yep. I freaking polished my mode at LV1. <laughs> it just yep. tell you when you don't know, accept the fact and find somebody who's no better and learn. Yep. You never go wrong with that. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for uh, taking an hour to chat with me today. We have some more exciting things coming. So if you guys made it this far to the episode, thank you for tuning in. If you guys have any questions for George, make sure you're reaching out. His email is always in the show notes. And, uh, until next time, we'll talk to you.